God. And what I'm praying today is God will help all of us take another step. How many of you would like to take another step with the Lord today? Well, the only way that happens is if we hear from God and obey what God says. So with that in mind, I want you to open your Bible, please, in the Old Testament to the Psalms in this hour. And I'd like you to find Psalm 119. Now, if you're familiar with the Psalms, you'll know that Psalm 119 is the longest of the Psalms. It's 176 verses long. I'm not teaching the whole thing today, and all God's people said. That's what I thought. 176 verses, and every verse in some way refers to the Scriptures. It is the Psalm of the Scriptures. Uh, when you study Psalm 119, it, I think it helps you fall in love with the Word of God. And when you fall in love with the Word of God, you fall in love with the God of the Word. I wish I had time to talk to you more about that, but I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to speak on the same theme in all three meetings, but I'm going to speak from a different scripture. And in the Bible study hour, this first hour together, I'm going to really have a Bible study with you and lay a little groundwork. Uh, because I think it'll help us get more out of everything God wants to say to us the rest of the day. And I'm beginning here in Psalm 119 and verse number 139. Because there's a key word here, I want you to mark in your Bible, and I want you to get fixed in your thinking early on. And this will be our word for the day. When I finish preaching today, I am okay with you not remembering my name. And I am fine understanding that you're not going to remember everything I say. I won't remember everything I say. But I want you to remember one word from the Word of God. Don't you know that one word from God can change everything? One word. And when the day is done and somebody says, well, the preacher preach on, I want you to say this word. And next Lord's Day, when you gather together, if the pastor says, well, the preacher preach on last week, I want you to say this word. If I see you six months from now and say, what did I preach on, I want you to say this word. And if I call your house at 3 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> now you're not going to say this word. But I want you to get the word. Here it is. Look at Psalm 119, verse 139. Let's read the whole verse out loud together. Ready? My zeal hath consumed me because mine enemies have forgotten thy words. Now, you remember I said every verse speaks of the word of God. So right there you have it. At the end of verse 139, would you circle in your Bible, thy words, thy words. But then go back to the first two words in the verse, and I want you to mark my zeal. I hope you'll get something that you can write on today because I'm going to give you some principles to write down and it'll be good if you can make a note of them. It'll help you remember them and maybe meditate on them a little more. But I want you to connect in your Bible the first two words of Psalm 119, 139 and the last two words, my zeal, thy words. Did you know you can tell a lot about a person by what they get excited about? Uh, if I really wanted to know you, I would want to know what makes you glad, what makes you sad, and what makes you mad. Because if you can figure out what people get stirred up over, it reveals what really is precious to them. For example, you go to a ball game, people lose their minds. How many of you ever noticed people lose their minds at a ball game? All right, confession's good for the soul. How many of you ever lost your mind at a ball game? Sure. Or stand in your living room, jumping up and down, screaming at the television like that makes any difference, you know. We get stirred up about things, and I'm not suggesting all that is wrong. We're made with emotion. Emotion has to be sanctified. You can't trust emotion. Did you know that? If you let emotion run your life, it'll ruin your life. And some people live their whole Christian experience riding this, this emotional roller coaster up and down and in and out and on and off and hot and cold, and that's not what I'm talking about. I, I'm not here today to try to stir you up emotionally. I'm not... I'm not discussing some kind of shallow sentimentality in our faith. That is not at all what I'm talking about. In fact, G. Campbell Morgan, one of the great Bible teachers of the bygone era, said, painted fire never burns. I like that, don't you? So we're not after painted fire. No, we're, we want the fire of the Holy Spirit of God. Look, when real fire comes through, it burns. When real fire comes through, it heats, right? When real fire comes through, it lights. We need the fire of God in our souls. And that is what the word zeal means. It is literally a word for heat. It is like boiling over, something so hot you can barely touch it. In fact, the, the verse really reveals that. Look at verse 139 again. It says, my zeal hath, what's it say please? Consumed me. Could I ask you a personal question? What are you consumed with? Are you consumed with anything? 
Someone asked me not long ago, in, in travel and in and out of so many churches, what's one of the things you see that is of particular concern to you? And I guess they wanted me to talk about, you know, uh, music trends or something like that uh, because of the context of the conversation. And I said to them, apathy. Apathy. Something's happened to the Lord's people. We've lost our hunger and thirst after righteousness. We've, we've lost our panting after God like the deer pants after the water brooks. We've, we've lost our prayer of Paul, oh, that I may know thee. We've lost it. We've lost our passion of Moses. Show me now thy way that I may know thee. We, we've lost something. I want you to go back in your spiritual memory for just a moment. Go back to when you first got saved. How many of you remember when you first got saved? Hope you remember when you got saved. I know this. For me, when I first got saved, I was so excited about it. I want to tell everybody. First person I saw after I got saved. I got saved today. I, I wanted them to know it. I wanted them to be excited about it as I was excited about it. I remember the early days of my Christian growth. Uh, beginning to study the Bible. Learning things from Scripture. How thrilled I was. I remember being excited that I could pray and God would hear and answer my prayers. I remember my burden for other people to get saved and my desire to be with God's people. And I don't know, I don't know how this happens, but somewhere along the way in our Christian experience, it's almost like we settle in. We become professional in our faith. And we know all the answers to the Bible questions and we, we know where to find Ezekiel now in our Bible and we know how to follow along in a hymn book and we know all the proper etiquette in church. We've learned the Christian culture, but we've lost something of our zeal for the Lord. And here's what I'm praying for this Lord's day. I'm praying today that God will light the fire again. That God will do something to, to stoke the embers that are burning low and throw some Holy Ghost kindling wood from the Word on the fire and cause us to be consumed again with the zeal of the Lord. We usually use this expression, our zeal for the Lord. But I'm going to show you in just a moment in the Bible that the operative expression is not our zeal for the Lord, it's the zeal of the Lord. Watch this. It is the heart of God capturing your heart. Can I tell you what I've discovered? When God's heart gets your heart, and your heart gets God's heart, nobody has to stand up here and prime you and pump you and pressure you to do the right thing because there's something on the inside that makes you want all that God has for you. And this is awful, Pastor, but there are people that come to church every Sunday almost like deflated balloons trying to get enough air in their balloon again to make it another week. And we drag in like, I hope the preacher's got something good for me today. Let me just tell you something. God has something good for you every day. Somewhere we've got to learn how to connect. Look at, look at the verse again. My zeal. Make it personal. Psalm 119, 139. It's got to be personal if it's going to be real in your life. My zeal to thy words. And I love that word because. Look, God is the great cause. You want a motivator? Find your motivation in the Lord. So across the top of your paper, would you write this little question, what am I zealous about? Just write that question down. What am I zealous about? If you were really honest and I said, stand and tell us what you're zealous about, what would you say? If I really wanted to know, oh, oh if I really wanted to know, I wouldn't ask you. I'd ask your husband or wife because they would tell us. I'd ask your children because we all know children tell the truth, right? At least about other people. What are you zealous about? God knows. With that in mind, I'm going to walk you through a number of scriptures, and some will turn to, and some I'll give you references. You can write them down. But let's learn some principles, I hope, that lay a little framework for everything we're going to study today. Go back in your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 19 with me just a moment. Let's start here, because there's a great phrase found in 2 Kings chapter number 19 that I think will help us. As we begin to think about the zeal of the Lord. Now, 2 Kings chapter number 19, we're jumping right in the middle of it. The prophet comes and has a word for the Lord's people. And look at verse number 31. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, 
And they that escape out of Mount Zion, and here's the phrase. Would you read the last phrase of 2 Kings 19, 31 out loud with me? Ready? The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. I love that. <laughs> in other words, the Lord's going to make it happen. Did you know God can make more happen than you can in a thousand lifetimes? Look, God can do more in a moment than we could in a hundred meetings. What does that? Would you mark it in your Bible? It is the zeal of the Lord of hosts. The emphasis here, not on the host, but on his heart. Sometimes we get to thinking about the angels. Forget the angels just a minute. The angels will be the first to tell you, look to Jesus. Look, the heart of God is this. It's consumed. Holy zeal, righteous zeal, truthful zeal, godly zeal. Isn't that what we need? So here's the first principle. Write this down, would you please? We need to know that zeal is a characteristic of our God. It's one of the attributes of God. If I took a little survey today and said, tell me the attributes. People would say holiness and mercy and justice and grace and wisdom. And that would all be right. And by the way, God is not more of one than he is of another. God is the perfection of all of his attributes because he is the holy God. Aren't you glad about that? The only attribute that is used more for God than any other in Scripture is holiness. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy is the Father. Holy is the Son. Holy is the Spirit. And I've been meditating on that. Why is holiness used more as, as a descriptor for God than all, any of the other attributes? I think the reason is because God is holy in all of his attributes. So holy is his mercy. Holy is his justice. Holy is his wisdom. And might I say, holy is his zeal. You can have a zeal for things that are unholy. Matter of fact, watch the news and you'll see a world full of that. Isn't that right? You don't even have to turn the news on. Just look around you. You can get excited about, consumed with something that doesn't bring God glory. But all of God's zeal is holy zeal. It is one of the attributes of our God. Now, why would we begin here? Because I think if we can understand that this is something that is characteristic of God, we begin to understand it's something that should be characteristic of God's children. If I'm going to get close to God and his nature is going to become my nature and the Holy Spirit's going to form Christ in me, what does that look like? I'm just going to tell you, you can't be near Jesus and lack zeal. That's impossible. When the day is done, you're going to see that when Christ came, he came full of the zeal of the Lord. And I want to tell you, the closer you get to Jesus, the more zealous you're going to become. Let them call you radical. Let them call you a bunch of fanatics. Let them say you're crazy. Let them say you don't fit the culture. It's all right. The zeal of the Lord of hosts has consumed your life. I, I was looking this week at this phrase, the zeal of the Lord of hosts. And it's, it's woven all through Scripture, really. This principle. Uh, Ezekiel chapter number 5 and verse number 13 tells us that God speaks and acts out of his zeal. So his words and his works come out of a zealous heart. His words are on fire and his works are on fire. He's consumed with it. But I noticed something as I started studying this phrase. Would you like to know who used this phrase more than anybody else in Scripture? There is one preacher one preacher that this phrase characterized his preaching. It came up over and over and over again. If you had time to look at the context of the text we're in right here in 2 Kings, it would reveal it to you. It was the prophet Isaiah. Matter of fact, just for fun, let's take a little trip, all right? Go to the book of Isaiah with me for just a moment. Go to Isaiah chapter 9. And let's just mark them in our Bible. You can make a list of them. Look at Isaiah 9. At Christmas time, we, we love verse 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So we know this is a messianic passage. We know it's about Jesus. But look at verse number 7. Isaiah 9, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. Read it with me, church. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Who's going to get this done? Our zealous God's going to get this done. I love that. By the way, did this prophecy come to fruition? Absolutely. Everything God foretells, he always fulfills. And the son came and the child was born. The zeal of the Lord of hosts got it done. Let me give you another one. You're still in Isaiah, right? Come over to Isaiah 37. Verse number 32, and now it is about the remnant. The first, it was about Messiah coming. Now it's about the remnant. Look at Isaiah 37, verse 32. 
For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, read it with me, church, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. By the way, if you're paying attention, you'll see this is an exact quote of what we read in 2 Kings 19.31. So, we find it in the historical books, we find it in the prophetical books. Can I just point something out to you? When God repeats himself, it's always for emphasis. God never repeats himself because he forgot he said something. If God repeats himself, if you find the same phrase over and over again, if you find the same verse and the same story twice, it's because the Holy Ghost is saying, this is important, pay attention to this. The zeal of the Lord. Come on over to chapter 59, would you? Same book. The prophet preaches. Look at Isaiah 59, verse 17. What a verse this is. I wish I had time to study this verse with you today. You should study these verses. It's a... It's a Description of God, of Christ. The previous verse says there was no intercessor. God marveled there was no intercessor. So you know what Jesus did? Because there was no intercessor, he became the intercessor. Because there was no mediator, he became the mediator. Aren't you glad Jesus stepped right in between? He stepped in the middle. Look at verse 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and, read it please, was clad with zeal as a cloak. <laughs> I'm looking around. Best I can tell everybody got up and put on clothes this morning. Thank you for doing that. We really appreciate it. And when you left the house, you put on a coat. Certainly today you put on some kind of a cloak. I love this. Look at the verse. He's describing the armor of God. This connects to Ephesians 6, you see. When you put on the armor of God, it's not something you put on. It's someone you put on. Paul said you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the armor is just the attributes of God. It's the very nature and characteristics of our Lord. Who is he? Look at him. He's righteousness. He's salvation. He's holy vengeance. But what is his overcoat? His cloak is zeal. Anybody starting to see the picture here? Same book. Come on over to chapter 63 with me. Isaiah 63. Look at verse number 15. The prayer. Look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Would you mark this? Where is thy zeal and thy strength? The sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me. Are they restrained? This is really interesting, but when you pray, you should call upon the nature of God. You should appeal to the attributes and character of our Lord. But I don't know that I've ever in my prayer called on the God of zeal. Have you? I've many times said, oh, Lord, strengthen me now. Lord, I need wisdom. Help me. Lord, I'm weak as water. Sustain me. Oh, God, I've sinned. Have mercy upon me. But when was the last time you said, Lord, show your zeal? Lord, let the fire burn again. Oh, God. Light the way for us. Consume me with you. That's a great prayer, isn't it? And I think it's very significant that Isaiah, who was the prophet Isaiah? Isaiah was the prophet that saw God high and lifted up in his holiness. The more you see God, the more you see the zeal of our God. Who was Isaiah? He was of all of the prophets, the prophet that spoke more of the Messiah, the coming Christ, than any other. Watch this. When you get a glimpse of Jesus, you get a little glimpse of the zeal of our God. You want to see what the zeal of the Lord looks like? Look at Jesus. And so, we're taking an attribute and we're applying the attribute to our own life. So, let me give you a second principle. Would you write this down? Number one is that zeal is characteristic of our God. The second is that zeal has to be consecrate, concentrated on Christ. It has to be concentrated on Christ. Like every other emotion and every other motive, it can be misplaced. Did you know you can be zealous about something and be zealous about the wrong thing? For example, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21 verse 2 references King Saul who in his zeal for Israel said, I'm going to wipe out the Gibeonites. Now there was a problem with that. A vow had been made to the Gibeonites. A promise had been made. And so he was about to do something unethical, immoral, wrong in the eyes of God because he was zealous for the people of God. Did you know that you can do the, the wrong thing thinking you're doing the right thing? I'm going to tell you the worst zeal. Write this down, would you please? The most destructive zeal is religious zeal. <laughs> you don't believe me? Let's get a history book and read about 
Constantine who tried to use the cross to make people convert to Christianity and killed a bunch of people because he thought he could coerce their conscience. That's, that's wrong. You can't coerce the conscience of a man that God created free will and the ability to choose in. That's, that's impossible. But it's destructive. Look at religious movements around the world today. You look at the Islamic invasion in so many places. And what do they do? They try to use force as their weapon. That, that is not the weapon that God has given us. And then let's get right back to where we are. Did you know people can sit in Bible-believing churches and be zealous for church but not for Christ? They can be zealous for things that are related to God, connected to God, about God, but not God himself. All the peripheral things, but they miss the Lord. I'll prove that to you. I think the Apostle Paul is the classic example of this. We won't turn to all of them, but let me give you the scriptures. Just listen to them carefully. See if you get a common thread here. Acts chapter 22, verse number 3. In his own testimony, he's speaking of his past before his conversion on the road to Damascus. He said, I was zealous toward God. Wait a minute. You, you mean you were zealous toward God before you got saved? Mm-hmm. You mean you were zealous toward God when you didn't know Jesus? That's right. Now listen to this one. Galatians 1 verse 14. He said, I was more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. You can be zealous about traditions, even good traditions, and make that your goal. Oh, dear friends, hear me with your heart just a minute. There's only one who's worthy of being our goal and the objective of our affection and, and the aim of our adoration, and that is our worthy Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's the goal. If anything in your life, if anything in your family, or if anything in this church is the goal besides Jesus, you have a misplaced zeal. No matter how excited about it you are. And then... How about this one? Philippians 3, verse number 6, in his testimony and description of his old life, he said, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Let me tell you how zealous Paul was. He was so zealous for what he believed and so convinced that it was right and so consumed with his cause that he was willing to kill people and throw them in jail and hold the coats when they stoned the first martyr of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Acts. He was pretty zealous, wasn't he? But it wasn't until he came face to face with Jesus and had his own encounter with the risen Christ that he became zealous about the right things. Study the rest of the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. What was it characterized by? I would say it's characterized by zeal. I mean, look, my friend, you don't, you don't have three missionary journeys and get stoned, get up out of the rocks and go right on without having some zeal on the inside. Can we agree on that? But now it was right zeal because it was righteous zeal. It was fixed on the Lord Jesus. Even Paul would later write, Romans chapter 10, verse number 2, that he was burdened for his people Israel because they had a zeal of God. Do you remember the rest of the phrase? But not according to knowledge. That's spiritual knowledge. It wasn't that they, didn't, they weren't bright people or educated. In fact, they knew the Scriptures, but they didn't know the God of the Scriptures. So people grow up even in churches like this and there are lots of things and they have lots of Bible knowledge and they even get lots of zeal about Christian things. But somewhere, if we don't really know God and the Lord is not at the center of it all, if our zeal is not rooted in Christ, it's misplaced. So it, if it's going to be consecrated, concentrated on Christ, it has to be consecrated to Christ. It has to be sanctified. And I'm, I'm standing here talking to you right now, but in my heart, I'm crying out to the Lord, Lord, please purify the zeal of my heart. Help me be passionate just about what you're passionate about. Help me love what you love. Help me hate what you hate. Help me want what you want. That's what zeal is. It's to see like God sees and think like God thinks and feel like God feels and do what God would do. Oh, may the zeal of the Lord of hosts consume every one of us. Third principle. I want you to write down, not only is zeal a characteristic of God, we got that right, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, not only is zeal has to be concentrated on Christ, but number three, zeal should be connected to what matters most in life. It should permeate all of life, but it should be connected to what matters most in life. Can I tell you what matters most in life? Only the things that are connected to the Lord and eternity. You know, people get pretty exercised about their jobs. Thank God for jobs. Be a good steward of it. Work hard. But let me just remind you of something. Uh, that when you leave this world, nobody ever puts on the epitaph on their tombstone what they did for a living. 
Nobody does that. I, I've walked through a lot of graveyards and memorial gardens, and I've never once seen, you know, wonderful plumber on a grave marker. Most successful businessman in town. I've never seen that. Because when you get to the end, that's not what matters. How much money you made, how big the house is, how new the car is, how long the vacation is, how much money's in the, in the retirement account. That's not the thing. No, no. What you ought to be most zealous about is what's going to outlive this world and outlast your life. It was Adrian Rogers who said, you want to find out how rich you are? Add up everything money cannot buy and death cannot take away. That's pretty good. So if we were to make a list today of all the things money can't buy and death can't take away, what would you say really is in your account today? And that's what you ought to be zealous about. Let's go to the New Testament. Let me show you two scriptures that I want you to make a note of because they help us see what they should be, our zeal should be connected to. Now let's start in Titus. You know this passage. Famous, isn't it? Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we say, amen, 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 preacher. But look at verse 14, because it doesn't end in verse 13. In fact, if you look at the grammar, uh, there, there's not a period, there's a semicolon, which means there's more to come, and what follows is connected to what precedes. Look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us. Anybody glad God sent the Lord Jesus and Jesus gave himself for you? Let me tell you why. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. So that's, that's the negative, right? He dealt with our sin and our death and our hell and our judgment. He's kept that from us and kept us from that. And we all say praise the Lord. But don't miss the positive side, the reverse side. And mm, purify unto himself. Lord purifies. A peculiar people, his own people, owned by God. Branded by the Lord with the mark of mercy upon our lives. Distinguished from those who do not know God. A peculiar people. And notice please the ultimate characteristic. Would you read it out loud with me church? Zealous of good works. Would you mark that in your Bible? Zealous of good works. One of the marks that a person really belongs to the Lord is that they become increasingly zealous about the right things. If you're really growing in your faith, and I'm, look, just because you're getting older doesn't mean you're growing. Age and stage are not the same. But if you're really growing in your faith, some things are coming to mean less and less to you, and a few things are coming to mean more and more to you. This is the process of sanctification. Notice the passage, purify unto himself. Purify unto himself. This is not just to purify you from the world. This is not just to purify you in the eyes of other people. This is a Godward purification. This is a drawing nearer and nearer to God. Look, you get near the holy fire, it will burn out the dross. It will purge and burn up and consume away things that do not matter. And it will leave only the gold and only the refined things. What is this? This is... What happens when a person becomes zealous for the Lord? And then another scripture, go back a few pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 with me. We know this passage is a passage that deals with spiritual gifts and uh, charity, all of that. Look at 1 Corinthians 14 verse number 12. Last verse of 1 Corinthians 14, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts... Let me just pause and ask, are you really zealous to discover how God made you? Are you zealous to discover what the Lord put in you when he saved you? Are you zealous to identify what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life? See, I think when you were born, you were given gifts. But when you were born again, you were given spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts were not for you to use. They were for you to be used. May I ask, have you discovered? I think it's sad. Some people live their entire Christian experience and never discover the gifts God put in them by the Holy Spirit. Have you discovered what God has put in you to use in this body of believers? Are you exceedingly zealous to discover that? This is not a reproof. At, at a glance, you think, uh-oh, he's getting ready to rebuke them. No, keep reading. For as much as you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. He said, yes, more. As zealous as you are, you should be more zealous. 
As hungry as you are, you should be more hungry. He said, I pray you will discover how God made you, become everything God saved you to become, so that the whole church will be better because of it. I'm going to tell you the churches that are really being blessed. People ask me that a lot. What churches have you been in that are really being blessed? And they think, you know, because they have a lot of people there, they're being blessed. Or they have money in the bank, they're being blessed. I'm going to tell you the churches that are really being blessed, they're the churches that are being a blessing. The churches that are really being blessed, it's not because the pastor preaches good sermons on Sunday. It's because the people in the pew have all plugged in, found their place, doing their part, and they're all just serving Jesus and happy serving the Lord. You know, that is, that's zealous Christianity. Now look at these two scriptures I just gave you. Titus 2 verse 14, zealous of good works. 1 Corinthians 14 12, zealous of spiritual gifts. Notice please, and I, I love this. The first is a zeal for the glory of God. The good works are not for us to take credit. It's for God to get glory. He said, you're my people. I want people to look at you and think of me. So the first is a zeal for the glory of God. The second, 1 Corinthians 14 12, is a zeal for the good of the church. This is really interesting. But zeal should never attract people to us. Zeal should point people to Jesus. And it should minister to everybody else around us. If you get on fire for God, people won't think more of you. They'll think more of Jesus. And everybody around you will be blessed because of it. Would you like that? Then the zeal of the Lord has to get a hold of you. And you have to get a hold of it. One more principle, and we'll stop this little Bible study. Let's review class. Number one, zeal is a characteristic of God. Number two, it has to be concentrated on Christ. Number three, it should be connected to what matters most in life. And number four, zeal is contagious. <laughs> Did you know zeal is like the measles? It breaks out on you. You get around it. You get around a really zealous Christian. After a while, it kind of rubs off on you. Would you like to know how to have a soul-winning church? I mean by that, not just a church that sees people walk the aisle and get saved, but a church where people are going out, winning people to Jesus, and bringing folks to Christ. Would you like to have a soul-winning church? Then let someone in this church get zealous about souls. Did you know when one person just gets on fire about winning people to Jesus, after a while, it reaches and touches others. This kind of fire spreads, and it's not wildfire. See, the Lord's zeal is never out of control. It's always under control. It's under his control. So we're not talking about some, some uh, religious euphoric experience and we got to tingle up our spine and wasn't that great. And no. No, we're talking about being under such the control of the Holy Spirit of God that now it's starting to minister to other people. Let me give you an Old Testament example and a New Testament example, all right? The Old Testament example is Jehu, 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse number 16. <laughs> Yesterday I was driving too fast at one point and uh, we were in traffic and, and my wife reminded me of it. I'm glad to have the preacher traveling with me this week. And uh, I quoted this verse to her. Isn't it funny how we can quote scripture out of context, make ourselves feel better. But look at 2 Kings chapter 10. Uh, because in 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse number 16, Jehu is on a mission. What is it? Drive out sin. <laughs> Deal with the offenders. And he says to the king, uh, verse 16, he said... Come with me. He says here to this man, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. Everybody remember Jehu who drove his chariot furiously? How many of you think you're married to Jehu? Anybody? Yes. This is true. This is true. I was in Orlando the other day preaching a few weeks ago on a Sunday. And uh, it was wonderful. But I had to leave right after the morning meeting to fly to Ohio. And the pastor said to me, they were having a big thing on the grounds. He said, I'm having one of our assistant pastors take you to the airport. I said, no problem, great. He said, he'll get you there fast. And I said, okay, good, because I had a tight connection. And we got in the car. The man was 80-some years of age. It's true. His wife's in the back seat. He's in the front seat. And he drove as fast as any person who's ever taken me to an airport anywhere in my life. At one point, this is no joke, and he's talking with hands off the wheel. He's, you know, looking at me, driving down the interstate in Orlando, talking. At one point, I looked over, and the speedometer read 99. And he caught himself, and he said, did I just hit 100? I said, no, but it was perilously close. I said... We're not that in a hurry. I'm going to make it. I think I'm going to make it. Slow down, J.U., you know. J.U.'s known for driving his chariot furiously, but he had a mission. What was it? He was zealous to drive out sin. I'll tell you one of the things that we ought to be zealous about is dealing with sin, getting sin dealt with. That's the negative side. And J.U.'s an example of that, and it was contagious. He said, come on, ride with me here. See my zeal for the Lord. I wonder, can anybody see your zeal? For the Lord. 
Does anybody see the zeal of the Lord in you? And then we'll end with a New Testament example. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Jehu, good Old Testament example. How about the Corinthian Christians? Somebody said, these carnal people? Yeah, well, we're all carnal people. Remember, Corinthians was not written to show you their carnality. It was written to show you your carnality. We're all fleshly. We all have to deal with our old man, the old nature. But they were growing in the Lord. And by the time he wrote this second letter, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. First, touching the ministering to the saints, it's superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago. And, would you mark this, your zeal hath provoked very many. If Jehu was the negative, this is the positive. These people are zealous about giving to the work of God and advancing the gospel. They're worked up about it. They're excited about it. He said, I, I know the forwardness of your mind. You know what zeal is? It's a forward mind. It's a, let's advance. Let's get on with it for the Lord. Enough of this apathy. I don't want this weak, anemic, laid-back, run-of-the-mill, everyday, ordinary kind of Christianity. I want a New Testament faith and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I want all that God has for us. That's the zeal of the Lord. But look at it carefully in verse number two. He said, I just want you to know I've been boasting about you. I've been bragging on you. They weren't bragging on themselves. You don't brag about your own zeal. Look, if the fire of the Lord breaks out on you, you won't have to tell anybody. They'll know it. Hey, Moses, when you come off the mount, they'll see the glory of God on you. Hey, you disciples, they'll take knowledge of you you've been with Jesus. You get close to God and the Lord breaks out on you, it'll be contagious. You won't have to inform everybody. They'll know. But I love this. He said, I just want you to know that your zeal has provoked very many. You know what I'm praying? I'm praying there would be such a revival of zeal in our hearts, in our homes, in this church family, that it could be said of the people gathered here on this Lord's Day that your zeal hath provoked very many.